are the marbles that we've discussed many times this weekend, bits of rubber that have chunked off tyres. They build up inside wheel arches, which we saw particularly demonstrated with this car, yeah. which actually had a small fire in the wheel arch caused by lumps of old rubber that were thrown up in the wheel arch. Also on the edges there, you'll see bits of gravel that have been pulled off by cars running a little bit wide. And uh, the tyre diary, this is the basis of next year's tyre bible going on here, mm. I think. Yes, absolutely. Just keeping a, a, a note of every possible variable and statistic. And uh, that's why people at Michelin are as good at building race tyres as they are. Ten uh, technicians, if you like. There are many uh, people fitting tyres here uh, this weekend, but Michelin brought uh, ten proper tyre engineers to service all the teams they're looking at in the pit lane, and uh, they'll be as tired as the rest of us. <laughs> I'm off now. I've made my contribution to the afternoon. <laughs> tired as the rest of us. And they said it couldn't be done. Um, Eric van der Poel leads from Stefan Lemere, and uh, Simonson is in third place in the number 10, Aston Martin. Uh, the 15 car of Stefan Daudi, as Graham said, in the uh, tail end of a double stint, is in fourth place. And then in fifth place is our first GT2 car, and that is a measure of the rate of attrition. Peter Cox in the number eight Lamborghini is still going, but now 10th overall and on his third gearbox uh, in yes. 24 hours, which is quite a lot. And uh, we've lost the number six Corvette. Uh, which is currently parked in the, moment. in the garage, but... Mm. But, you remember, dear viewer, that when we were last with you, uh, there was a lot of smoke and issue and fire, it was indeed, on fire, basically. From, <laughs> from underneath. Well, the Corvette has risen phoenix-like, if you oh! will, from the ashes. And um, although a rather singed Fabrizio Gollin got out of the car, having uh, remembered to set off the onboard fire extinguishers first, as a, a very tentative corner manoeuvre by the number one Maserati grabs our attention, and the rain yeah. falls ever heavier. In fact, the heaviest I've seen uh, since last night's little episode. So this might be the rain we've all been well, waiting for, yeah, mightn't it? it be? And won't Kessel Racing be cursing their yeah. misfortune, having just sent their next driver, uh, which was Henri Moser, in fact, out on slicks? Um, let's get back to Phoenix. They have repaired the car. They sent it out for a few laps in the hands of Mike Hazemans, who reported that it still has something of a misfire. And so what they've done is to park it up for the time being, do the calculation as to how many laps they need to complete before the end of the race in order to satisfy the conditions of getting points in the championship, which is their aim now. Clearly, they can't win this race. But if they score points, then that will all go towards the championship. And, of course, this is just the midway point of a championship. So they so will be fifth they come are, what may. They are supposed to be bringing the car back out. They will be sixth come what may because oh, there's yes. the top four. The Cox. interloper is Peter Cox in the Lamborghini. Uh, who has sailed along merrily uh, since they put in their third gearbox. And uh, Mike Hazeman's still just about on the top page of our timing screens in 19th place, but gradually slipping down the order um, lap by lap, of course. However, in the GT class of GT1 classification, which is what is of interest to them, they can't fall any further. So they will get some points, and that's what they came here for. And if you can salvage a few points from what to us looked like a total disaster yep. when it happened, uh, that's job very well done indeed. And given what happened at the season end last year when we had something in the order of a dozen or more drivers yeah. all still in with a mathematical chance of winning at the last round, winning the championship at the last round at Zolder, that, that garnishing of a funeral, a few garnering of a few extra points could be very important. On board in uh, the number 10 car, as you can see for yourself, while we've been talking, the rain has continued and it's grown. So I think this is the longest and strongest bout of rain we've had in daylight. It was apparently worse than this in the wee small hours, uh, but this is proper rain now and it doesn't appear to be letting up. No, the windscreen wiper working uh, proper time now. So, ooh, little twitch from the front end there, not quite wanting to bite on turn in as Simonson completes another lap. And the thing about it is he's now starting another lap on uh, slick tyres. Mm -hmm. uh, it is raining. If they decide that uh, inters are the call, he has to go six kilometres, three and a half miles. It's a big lap here. It's not like a little short circuit where you can come in in a minute and change on to more suitable tyres. You've got to go six kilometres, two and a half minutes almost, 
in the rain in one of the most challenging racetracks in the world before you can come back and put on a, a better mm. tyre choice. In these conditions, considerably over two and a half minutes. In fact, Simon's last lap time at 2.51 uh, versus two minutes 40 for each of the Maseratis. That's change your tyres mm. time, that is, isn't it? That's no doubt about it. When you're giving away 30 seconds on your dry weather time mm. on the lap of this length, it is time to have different tyres on. What they're all concerned about, of course, is the fact that when the rain stops, the wind is uh, quite brisk here, uh, which helps to dry the surface, but of course Spa is very well drained because it is such a hilly circuit, it's very well drained and there is never very much in the way of standing water here except in the case of torrential downpours like we had last year. Mm. And it may not be quite so damp around the back of the circuit. In fact, I would say it doesn't look quite so damp around here, does it? No, no telltale uh, rain on the camera lens there from our elevated position way up above the uh, drop down between the uh, uh, Rivage and Pour. And they're about as far away from us at the start line as they can be on this circuit round there. The, the one half of the circuit is about three kilometres away from here and uh, rain showers can be uh, very isolated. See there as they head back towards Blanchimont now and back towards the start finish line and they start to climb up again. They're driving back up into the rain, aren't they? That's how it looks at the moment. It's not affecting our race order, but these are exactly the tricky conditions that can so easily catch you out and in a second of time pitch you into the gravel. Ask Eric van der Poel. Mm -hmm. uh, who is currently leading and whose last lap was a 2.40, as you say, uh, after 539 laps with an hour and 37 minutes remaining. Uh, he's out there and uh, the umbrellas are still out around the circuit. Even the camera's got its raincoat on. Oh, yeah, so I was just wondering whether that was a bit, an improvised bin liner or, or a proper rain cover. Well, that's proper rain on this camera, isn't it? Yes, and that's up at this end of the track as the Aston approaches the uh, bus stop chicane. Very carefully. And the call is, it's and pit lane yeah, time. There we go, and there is the reason why. Common sense has prevailed, and the Giga Wave crew have called Simonson in, talented though he is. We would think we'll exploit his talents rather better on a tyre that offers some grip. And question his ability to walk on water as well. <laughs> well, there is always that. He does race in British GTs for Christians in motorsport, so <laughs> maybe he can walk on water after all. Who knows? Racing along with uh, Hector Lester in that team, and Hector Lester on the entry list here this weekend as well, but not with that team. And those are barely used tyres. So, Nigel Stepney's brought the number 10 car in uh, and hoping that this rain is going to last. Maserati have yet to make the call. That's the Michelin man, obviously, in consultation. The team have yet to make the decision. And uh, we have yet to be able to tell whether the rain is going to stay or go or just move around the circuit. But at the moment, one of the top three is on intermediate tyres. The first and second place in GT1 are on slicks. And all the GT2 men are still out there on slick tyres. Yes, it's, mind you, it's looking fairly steady now, isn't it?
as well be coming back in the car. Got seven laps on them. Um, as soon as you think whatever they do wrong, they can put right. There are 90 minutes of this fifth round of the FIA GT Championship remaining. 90 minutes of the Spa, 24 hours. The rain, which was falling quite steadily in the area of the start line at La Source, has now more or less stopped. And those people, and that principally means the number 10, Aston Martin, Alain Simonson, who came in and went for an intermediate tyre, are quite possibly now wishing that they hadn't done so. At the moment, the two Maseratis, and that's the race leader there, the number one car, are still out on slick tyres. Just before we came back live a couple of seconds ago, we watched Michael Bartels in deep conversation with his team technicians and with the Michelin tyre engineer, yeah. and their decision appears to have been, let's not do anything just yet. Uh, and it appears to us to have been the correct one. We look at our timing screens, Graham and I, and we can see that uh, they have six laps in hand over third place. So whatever they do wrong with tyres, they can probably put right, even if it is a total disaster. Yes, you would think so, wouldn't you? And the other thing that the timing screens show us is that Davide Rigon uh, in the BMS Scuderia Italia car, who was in the back of shot, that we saw taken from La Source back towards the bus stop just a moment ago and who will be probably the next car through that shot if they were to hold it. Uh, there he is just in the corner of your screen. Uh, is still making up time ahead of all his pursuers in GT1. So again, these changing conditions seem to be dealt with very, very adequately, to say the least, by the Pirelli tyres. It's just a shame that uh, Enrico there, the uh, Pirelli the PR guy, for once isn't that trackside to, uh, to to take a slap on the back because uh, he he comes in for a fair bit of stick one way and another. And, uh, and here they have excelled themselves. And the extent of that excelling is that his last lap, Rigon was 2.41 and uh, Collard's was 2.43. Mm. So if you can just keep on banging away at two seconds a lap, and, you've got it made, haven't you? And, and Tony Wielander at 2.45. And we saw a couple of years ago at Mugello just what Tony Wielander can do in the wet, given the right, uh, given the right piece of rubber and the right car. Yeah, absolutely. So... Uh, the weather has thrown a little bit of a wild card into the mix here. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, I know exactly how you feel. And that's how all the team managers feel. What do I do now? Is it raining or isn't it raining? <laughs> that could have been Nigel Stetney's look, couldn't it? Absolutely Having just right brought up. his Aston Martin in to put it onto wets. The weather gods have decided it's probably not going to stay that wet, although as I speak, again, there's still a little bit of water in the air, which is heading down onto the track and just beginning to patter against the... Uh, the, the uh, window of our commentary box which indicates that maybe the wind direction is changing as well now whether that will mean that we get a more constant drop of rain falling as it as it does indeed uh, is strengthen as we uh, as we speak yes the forest of the Ardennes which is basically all those trees you can see around you uh, is a hilly area and that means that rain comes from just around the corner any corner 
Mm. It just floats around the edges of the hills and appears in the valleys. And as you can see, it's back because it is now falling uh, reasonably steadily outside. And any moment now, and in comes the number one car. Now, this is uh, a little bit earlier than we might expect, and this might well be the intermediate fitment that they were discussing with Michelin. Maybe they've made a decision. Maybe their weather forecasting is good. Maybe they've got two blokes in a tent on a hill like CR Scuderia, and they can see where the weather's coming from. But maybe they're just going to... Uh, uh, Play the odds here, bring one car in for Inters and leave the other one out on slick, so whatever happens, they'll have got one of them right. Well, whatever they do, they're going to fuel it up first. There is the number two car going down past the old pit lane. The old pit's due to be demolished anytime soon, so if you haven't already got a picture of it, grab one soon, because they won't be around much longer, we are told. What is going to be the tyre choice? The answer is none. It's just a fuel stop at the moment. So maybe the shake of the head from the Michelin man was to say, actually, you don't need to change tyres at all on this stop. Well, they've obviously got a, a bunch of seaweed hanging up in the Michelin uh, area of the paddock. And you're right, Graham, they haven't done a thing about tyres, which means uh, that they've saved a bit of time because mm -hmm. a full change of tyres will cost you uh, a good 15 or 20 seconds, depending on how slick you are with your... I'm sorry how quick you are with your tyre change. Uh, and increasingly, I remember those 30 sets of slick tyres that we were talking about that each of the Michelin cars have basically got to call on during the course of the weekend. They're getting to the end of those and you're starting to see that double stinting of the tyres of necessity rather than by choice. Mm, yes, could well be by now. And with the number of changes of condition we've had, there must be stacks of part-used tyres all over the place. <laughs> There's a message just appeared on the bottom of our screen that says 62 and 112 must turn on the lights. From what I remember of 62, which is the Scuderia Ecos Ferrari, uh, turning on the lights could be a bit of a problem, especially at the back. Uh, yes, could well be. 174 coasting to what look, looks like a standstill. That, I believe, is at the top of Eau Rouge and uh, we've seen more than one car close to a stop there over this weekend. Andrea Bertolini looking anxiously out of the, uh, yes. out of the door, the knowing look. That was a very uh, yeah. PR-conscious... Uh, yes, we're OK, one. yes. We're on top of it. Really, he's worried, and you'd have to be. Yeah. Everyone in this pit lane is worried. Let's not make any mistake about this. No-one knows what the right call is going to be. And although Maserati are looking strong enough to withstand any kind of tyre error in terms of let's go back and do that again and fit some other ones, what they can't live with is what happened to them last year, which is the wrong tyres, wrong place, wrong moment, little bit of a spin, goodbye to the lead of the race. Mm. Looking at that six-lap gap to uh, Simonson, that's possibly not going to be an issue here, but uh, that's what we said last year, isn't it? It is indeed. Remember I mentioned the name Hector Lester just a few laps ago? You certainly did. That 174 Ferrari that we saw coming to a stop. Yes. That's his car. Oh, right. It's not, yeah. He wasn't actually at the wheel. Gail Lesudier is at the wheel, uh, normally a GT3 driver for Morgan. But um, I'm afraid uh, Hector Lester's car has um, decided that enough is enough for the time being, at least, just to the right of where this car is going past us. Look at the uh, stats there. David Regan wins naught. Emmanuel Collard wins 14. That's in this championship. That, it just illustrates how well this car is doing because it's not one of the dominant forces in this championship by any standard. The F430 is quite possibly the car to have at the moment, on the cusp of being the car to have at the moment in the championship. But this team uh, and this driver lineup isn't a dominant force, and you'd have to say that this car is very strong. This driver lineup is stupendous, and yet, yes, and the yet. form book is on its bumps, isn't it? It is rather. I'm rather thinking the Porsche team would have liked this rain that we're now seeing to have been with us a lot earlier. The flag you see is uh, for the, the stopped car there on our right as Emmanuel Collard speeds us past and up the hill through Radion and onto the Kemmel Strait again up towards the, uh, the highest part of the circuit but up at Le Combe. Kemmel Strait and uh, one of the fast parts of the circuit. Let's have a look and see where we are in this. Is Collard realistically going to do anything in an hour and a half? 
Probably not. Not without help from the 77 crew doing something wrong. One thing that impresses me about that BMS car is that it actually doesn't look as though it's done 22 and a half hours in a race. It looks very tidy. It's not all tattered around the edges. It hasn't had contact anywhere. It really does look in very good shape indeed, as does this one. The difficulty that this one had, and this one we're talking about, is number 50, Tony Vlander at the wheel, is that they had a penalty of changing an engine after qualifying and they had to start from the back, which inevitably, uh, because they could have the choice, meant they started from pit lane with fresh tyres and the option of missing out the first corner melee. Uh, there wasn't one, actually, was there? Really? As it turned out, there wasn't, but the potential is always there. Even in the 24-hour race, there are those who will insist they're going to win it at Turn 1, and you don't. You lose it at Turn 1. On board, then, in that number 50 car, and this is the dominant force in the championship. This is the team that came here uh, with a 1-2 lead in the series after winning all but one of the races this year. AF Corsa are absolutely dominant, and they're the only team so far to have taken a 1-2 finish in GT2. A little bit of curb hopping by Henri. And again, I think that's just for us to admire his technique. Hmm. The cameraman, rather than Henri. Uh, but quite possibly both. <laughs> quite possibly both, yes. He did uh, manage to keep all, all the uh, rest of the wheels pointing in the right direction. There is the uh, external view. Henri Moser, as we have observed, a GT3 champion last year, up into GT2 mm. this year, a driver of Swiss origin. That was very clever, very wasn't clever it? Very clever indeed. Nicely and, done, Mr. Director. Uh, what else they haven't noticed, of course, is he's immensely tall, and quite how they get him in a 430. Is it, well, mm. it's worth watching a pit stop just to see him scrambling in through the roll cage. Yes. <laughs> In any case, he's managed to uh, negotiate another lap. Currently sitting in one, two, three, four, five. Five, oh yes, Fifth because they dropped behind uh, the 55 car of Mullen and Co, didn't they? They were, they were once fourth, but uh, Peter Cox has got past them again as well. Uh, Peter not Cox that that's for, for place. No, Peter Cox in the number eight Lamborghini, I think, holds the current record, yes he does, for pit stop visits. It's on its third gearbox. It's been into the pits 33 times during the course of this race. Yes, it's uh, it's not been the most reliable of beasts, but when it has gone, it has gone like the proverbial wind. And uh, quite loudly as well. And great to see Peter Cox back behind a wheel too, because it's been a little while since he's had a drive uh, after a big accident in an ADAC Masters race about a month ago. Um, Peter resting up his, his back, but uh, ably assisted this weekend not only by Roman Rusinov, who hasn't really had too bad a spa, considering it's his first attempt, um, but by Thomas Enger and also by Jan Lammers. So, on paper, a very strong crew there, as is the AF course of number 50 we were just talking about, because Tony Vlander uh, is a regular driver all season long for them, as is Jimmy Bruni, but they've brought back Jamie Mello and Mika Salo, of mm. whom we have seen and heard nothing. nothing. We saw a little bit of in-car with Jamie earlier on, but to my, I, I haven't seen hide nor hair of Mika Salo, unfortunately, in the car. Um, and what? yet, he must have been there. I've seen his name <laughs> on the timing screens, but again, it's one of those things we've never been here mm. when he's been there. Yeah. Just been looking at the CR Scuderia cars, and for those of you who are uh, fans of this year's new team, uh, the 55 car of Tim Mullen is in fourth place in GT2, and Andrew Cordy in 56 is in sixth place. So they're there, or thereabouts. Yeah, They've yeah. had a bit of a, a, a few ups and downs during the course of this 24 hours, not least an early little touch between themselves, which didn't really signify a great deal in the overall scheme of things. You're looking at Pat Long there in the uh, 76 Porsche, and uh, that's had its troubles as well, but it's still there and going. But where is it on our leaderboard now? There it is. Yeah, clutch and gearbox were the were the, uh, the problems that they had overnight and dropped them a long way down the order. Currently seventh in, eighth in class, in fact. Now. Mm. No, seventh in class, I beg the pardon. You've got a one, two, three in the middle of those, which isn't a GT2 car. Oh, it's not, it's Monsieur Amoul. There you go. And the rain appearing to me to have just alleviated a little bit. There's still marginally enough water out there to keep the number 10 car out there. 
But uh, look at this, uh, Alan Simonson's last lap was a 2.43 and the Maserati's in front of him on slick tyres, 2.35. So it's not very good for uh, a car on slick tyres and they have backed off and lost about 10 seconds a lap. But he on his intermediate tyres has lost 20 seconds a lap. Mm. Yes, difficult to uh, to get all these all these choices right. The IMSA car that we've been following and are still looking at as I speak, uh, they'll be going away disappointed, I think, because they were coming here with a strong driver lineup uh, as Le Mans winners, not this year but last, and with good knowledge of Spa, and I'm sure they will have been anticipating a higher finish, at least a podium finish, uh, than what they've been left with following their overnight woes. This is number two, this is Stefan Lemere in the second of the Vitaphone Maseratis in second place. Uh, and a little bit of support for him as we prepare for another pit stop. And I think it's quite clear that they will stay on slicks for that if they change tyres at all. Mm. OK. We'll take your guidance on that one, Richard. Well, I'm if, sorry, but I think that's what they're going to do. You may well be right. I've consulted my um, seaweed and old and tattered as it is, it's, that's, it's a, that's, yeah. that's its opinion. Yep. OK. Uh, they have, well, they are still lapping in the in the 230s. Uh, best lap for both of their cars has been 216 and 217, so you can see how far off that pace they are at 234 now. And although the wiper is going there, I don't think it's going because it's raining now. I think it's going because it's just been left on. The car we're uh, anticipating then is the number two, which is the one of these two that always stops first in our sort of schedule of things, the mm. way we view their stops. Although the Van der Poel car has already made 22 stops to Lemare's 21, um, Stefan Lemare will be coming towards the end of this stint and handing over to again Alessandro Piaghidi. And the wipers off on the number two car now, and the rain is blowing away around another of the spa corners and leaving uh, Nigel Stepney certainly with a decision to make about Simonson and the number 10 car. He's got nothing chasing him and he's got no chance of catching the man ahead. So it's really a question of when and if. Uh, and in GT2, David Rigon in 77 continues to lead Emmanuel Collard as he has done since we started this race 23 hours ago. And we still have an hour and 16 minutes remaining on the clock.
We have one hour and 13 minutes remaining to run here at the Spa 24 hour race. And at the moment, Eric van der Poel looks absolutely unassailable uh, with a lead over his teammate that uh, could be caught if Stefan Lemeray wanted to put the pressure on. But uh, doubtless, he's been told he doesn't. No, we've yet to see the return to the track of, as has been promised, of, oh, now what's that all about? Because that Lamborghini should not be able to do that. That uh, is not as it should be, is it? Well, hmm, I was about to say Eric van der Poel's got an unassailable lead, if but I... then we said that this time last year. <laughs> and uh, the Lamborghini, as we've observed, our record holder with 33 pit visits on its CV in the last 23 hours, three gearboxes, uh, and uh, still as fast when it's going as it ever was. And I think Peter Cott's just proving a point because uh, his last lap at 2.26, <laughs> in the Poel's last lap at 2.33. Yeah, so, um, yeah, all right. Shout out for Peter Cox then, because that's a good lap in what is still fairly damp conditions here. The rain that was falling along the pit, pit straight has pretty much stopped for the time being. So uh, Peter Cox is clearly not to, uh, not to stop enjoying himself and uh, is out to do the best that they possibly can in that car, just to prove that had things fallen better for them in the transmission department... Or, in fact, not fallen off at all. Or, well, not fallen apart, then they would have been, uh, they would have been much closer to the, to the sharp end of things. As it is, they're 35 laps down, but that's still um, 56 laps ahead of the Mike Hazeman's Corvette, which has been sitting in its pick box all the time we've been on air for this last segment and since before then, in fact. Um, they know they've got a, a, a misfire. They don't want to send the car out any, late, any sooner than they need to, but uh, we have been promised it will return uh, in order to complete as many laps as it needs to become uh, a classified finisher and take the points. It will finish almost certainly in sixth place unless this has any more gearbox problems, because I don't suppose they've got very many left now. But as you can see, everywhere around this circuit, the dry line is there. Uh, for 100% of the distance. The only issues are where you have to go off line in order to pass slower traffic. Peter Cox just lapping slower traffic there, didn't have any choice. If you were in an overtaking race with somebody else, you'd have to go off line. But uh, sadly, with an hour and 10 minutes to go, the gaps are really such that there is unlikely to be any more door handle to door handle racing before the chequered flag. No, absolutely. We're on board with GT2 leader David Ragon coming up uh, to the bus stop again. This car has not put a wheel wrong for 23 hours, has had the right tyres on those wheels and now comes in for what must be uh, its final pit stop. Uh, and as you can see, this is a championship which not only features uh, senior drivers with lots of experience, but plenty of young men coming into GT racing to make a name because it is easier and cheaper to stand out here than it is in the megabuck world of Formula 3 mm. where you need to think of a budget in the region of something like £5 million pounds, or you aren't going to be noticed. No, I mean, Regon has already made his way up through the single-seater ladder as far as F3000, but it gets mighty expensive and the options beyond that are very few. Uh, and if you don't have the pennies in the piggy bank to buy an F1 seat with one of the uh, one of the teams that will that will buy uh, into uh, a driver, then where else are you going to go? And increasingly, the burgeoning uh, sport of GT and endurance racing is a world that these young hot shoes are likely to want to inhabit. Yes, indeed, we've seen it uh, often before, and you'll see it if you're a regular with the GT Championship, and I hope you are, and I hope you... If you aren't, then you are about to be, because we'll be back GT racing around the streets of Bucharest next time we go racing in about three weeks' time. Uh, and it is exciting. It does have lots of new young talent. And as we say, £5 million is roughly the budget you need to have about your person in order to climb the single-seater ladder to the bottom of Formula 1. Now, although we didn't see the stop on camera, the, uh, the speed with which they turned round, David Rigon, would suggest that mm. not only did they not do a driver change, but they didn't do a tyre change either. So they did actually fit a driver change in while uh, the fuel was going in. Matteo Malicelli getting back in the car, so 
another top performer for BMS Scuderia to see out the end of the race. The end of the race for 174 is to be found here on the outside of the track at uh, Eau Rouge. And I'm afraid that's... Is he looking for the spare tyre? <laughs> I think he's looking for anything that'll get that car started again. Yes, if he can fix it by himself, then uh, good luck to him. But uh, they're quite complicated little things, you know, and I think you need more to be a jeweller than a mechanic, don't you? Yes, the the um, the engineer for uh, CR Scuderia, Michael Sweatman, took me round they, the cockpit of, of their car for the Spa 24 hours, and it includes a little plastic box on the floor of the cockpit including a mobile phone, a few, <laughs> a few uh, well-selected tools, um, a very clever little bracket, which may well in future be called the Nyarkos bracket, which um, allows you to jury-rig a broken drive shaft to get the car back on one. How clever is that? Yes. Because, when, well, what happens when your drive shaft breaks is the diff sends all the power to the broken one because yeah. it spins more freely, yeah? Mm -hmm. So if you get that one out of the way and bracket it up against the car, the diff has no option but to send the drive to the, the one that still works, and that will get you home. <laughs> See? How clever is that? Somebody's thought long and hard about that, and uh, the result is a bracket that does exactly that, uh, which they carry on board. Um, and various fuses and little bits of electrical wiring, um, a long 10-metre radio lead so he can wander away from the car but still be in contact with the team for advice. They really, this is CR Scuderia all over, and as much as I'm sure they're delighted that both their cars are still running, they will be sorely disappointed that, again, it doesn't look as though they're going to pick up a trophy. Yes, they are a very ambitious team uh, as well as a very thorough team. And uh, this is their first year in the series as a team under the CR Scuderia banner, although we know all their names. Those are very slick tyres in the, the pit lane. And that is the figure of oh. Alessandro Piaghidi waiting to get into the number two car. Top marks for recognising his feet anyway. <laughs> That's Darren Turner about to get into the number 10 car. Uh, Alan Simonson's been out there on uh, intermediate tyres in this car for quite some time, and I dare say he's probably well fed up with it by now. And Simonson took over from Darren Turner, if the timing screen is to be believed. So taking turn, share and share about, no place in the cockpit, for, at the moment anyway, for Philip Peter, and certainly not for Andy Alexander. I don't remember, again, seeing his name on the timing scoring while we've been in but residence. But a lot of drive box. teams have brought with them a reserve driver. They're mm. allowed to have four, and as long as all four have taken part in uh, pre-qualifying or qualifying, then they may take part in the race. Now, a lot of teams have brought a fourth driver uh, on the understanding that he's uh, a fully rested reserve in case yeah. one of the others uh, feels poorly or has a problem, or as uh, Chris Niarkos said, in the case of Andrew Kukuli, gets pushed over in the pit lane exactly. by one of the reserve drivers. And the reason we haven't seen that fourth driver's name is because that isn't his name. It's Andrew Thompson, of course, with apologies to Andrew. A seat insert lying on the floor. That's how they uh, change the seat position for drivers of different heights, of course. And as you say, in goes Alessandro Piergidi. And this will be the last scheduled stop. This car should not now return to the pits for any reason, unless they need uh, a splash and dash five minutes before the end, because as you can see, there's just over an hour remaining on the countdown timer. Uh, 100 litres in the fuel tank, normally takes them about an hour. In this circuit, we've been seeing the pit stops coming in at about 50 minutes, so they might, might have to come back. Off come the Inters and on go the, uh, the slicks. Very well worn Inters as well, they were, yes, weren't they? very much so. But clearly an Inter rather than a full wet. Is there any Inter around the edges? Oh, no, there's still a bit of tread left. Yep, just about. You get it through an MOT on those, just about. <laughs> well, I'll cross my palm, sir, and I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Van der Poel leads it still, he's out there on track while uh, the number two Maserati has made its pit stop and what of this one? Have we missed the number ten or are we still waiting for him to come in? They're still waiting for him to come in, I think. Um, and Simonson, yes, I'm pretty sure he's still at the, the wheel. Lap, yes. Darren Turner was just making his way across from pit wall back to the, uh, the correct side of the pit lane to get into the car when 
And Alan Simonson does bring the car back through. And what's happening in GT2? While well, we're watching uh, Simonson heading pitwards, uh, there's a reminder of how well-worn those tyres have become. Michelin studying those very carefully. Uh, Malid Jelly leads Emmanuel Collard, 77 and 61, in the GT2 race. And uh, somebody else who's going to be happy with a second place because it's points and a finish, but unhappy because it isn't what they wanted. And that's going to be, uh, I'm afraid, the Pro Speed team, because I'm sure they came here expecting mm. for more than second place. And this car has stayed out, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Simon, Simonson not electing to pit this time, going round for another tour. His last lap was a 2.48. Uh, Van der Poel 2.32, Pierre Guidi uh, a pit stop uh, with a two minute first sector so he can ignore that at the moment but that is uh, about as slow as it's been isn't it? Mm. Yep it is, they, those tyres must be uh, crying enough I suspect and with the block tread probably moving around a little bit underneath the Aston at the moment which will feel very uncomfortable, it's almost as though you're driving around on slicks but on a dry track Mm. It's, it's almost as bad to have overheated wets on a dry track as it is to have cold and slicks on will, a wet one. They will break up fairly quickly, won't they? Yeah. Uh, Darren Turner there waiting for his moment. So, is it coming or not then? Did you hear that? Take Nigel Stephanie easy. saying, take it easy. Try telling a racing driver to take it easy. And you've really got to have a bit of personal authority about you to get them to do that and to think it's a good idea. Try telling Peter Cox to take it easy. We saw him flash past the Aston Martin just a moment ago. And indeed, Alan Simonson looks to be coming under pressure from a GT2 Porsche at the moment. Now, that shouldn't happen. No. In fact, that's even a G3 car, isn't it? Half a G3 car. Look, it's, it's the uh, severely damaged one, and he's definitely got a problem with those tyres now, hasn't he? Yes. He's up at the 250s. Peter Cox, you were talking about, who went flashing past. Everyone else is in the 230s and above, and Peter Cox, last lap, 2.23. Oh, that'll do nicely, sir. So uh, he is definitely still on it and anxious to prove the point about the Lamborghini that it is as quick as anything else out there. Uh, just got a few problems to sort out. To make it race worthy for a 24 hour distance, and bear in mind you only get one crack at this a year uh, at this level. There are several other 24 hour races, uh, but we've seen that the, the cost of participating in those can be higher than the benefit. And Jan Hyland, I think it was in the 160 Pro Speed Porsche who will be able to tell his grandparents a tale of his grandchildren, rather the tale of how he, he passed Alan Simonson in a GT1 Aston at Spa in his little G3 Porsche. And they'll think granddad's been drinking again. <laughs> <laughs> been on the sauce. Andrea Bertolini now suited up and booted, ready to, uh, to take out for the final session the uh, currently Eric van der Poel driven, and there it is, number one Maserati. Van der Poel, Pierre Guidi, Simonson, and we've just got 20 seconds of an hour 23 left to go, and then we'll be into the final hour here at Spa. And uh, this is another of those moments when people don't exactly back off, but if they've got a position they cherish, they'll try and keep it. You can see the dry line very clearly there as the number one car gets through the bus stop and past the pit entrance. There's the driver change for number 10. Yes, and looking out to our left, where most of the weather has been coming from, it looks rather brighter than it has of late. So uh, clearly Slicks is going to be the call for the last session for whoever comes in. Darren Turner doing up the buckles. That's Bertolini, the for Bertolini isn't it? Yes. getting the last bit of advice from Michael Bartels. I don't know what that was, that body language there, and I'm not going to speculate. But obviously, earlier on when we saw these two, uh, when Andrea Bertolini was out in uh, the car and Michael Bartels was doing his pacing up and down in pit lane, and Bertolini went past, and then he went past again, and then he went past again, and we thought, ooh, a little bit of friction, but quite clearly that was part of a plan, and Michael Bartels is just always pre-prepared for everything, isn't he? Yes, absolutely. This is where and Eric van der Poel will be keeping all his fingers and toes crossed in the hope that nothing untoward happens to him in this uh, session as it did in the equivalent one last year. This is uh, very nearly the end of his session. I wonder if it's this lap or the next one. Bertolini was uh, suited and booted and ready to go. They're taking their time with this, aren't they? 
Yes, this is the handover to Darren Turn Turner going on at Gigawave. And it is a long stop, something uh, less than routine going on here. And it may just be an inspection to make sure that they do make it cleanly to the end without any further uh, problems. We saw a big build-up of rubber in the wheel arches earlier on. Still uh, checking there again just to make sure there's nothing else that could foul the tyres in the last hour. Burns not exactly under pressure. Fourth place, Stefan Dildi in the number 15 Maserati is about uh, 10 laps behind them mm. at this point in the race, so they could afford to sit there for a lap and scrape the rubber off everywhere and uh, still not really be threatened in terms of position. And they're obviously not challenging for second place because there's a six-lap gap between them and second. Yep, absolutely. There is the Aston finally making its way out of pit lane at the requisite speed. Comes round in a, a copy of the Lasseur's hairpin, if you like, but within the wall, then rejoins the main downhill grid for the old circuit. And so... Uh, Darren Turner enters the final hour, 57 minutes on the countdown clock. We've done 555 laps. And Eric van der Poel leads Alessandro Pierguidi from Darren Turner to Stefan Daudi. That's one, two, three, and four in GT1. And it's Malucelli, Collard, Villander, and Mullen. One, two, three, and four in GT2. And uh, we anticipate no changing there. Uh, and everybody in every pit box along the spa pit lane will now be searching for a piece of wood to touch. <laughs> and cursing the house of nickel. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> the commentator's curse actually has been very gentle this weekend and we haven't uh, hardly broken anything, have we? Thus far. Yes. Thus far. Here is the uh, leader, Eric van der Poel, and... Uh, Often a, a popular choice as a, an additional driver here at Spa. A wealth of experience, four victories under his belt already, and uh, never, I think, short of a drive at Spa if he wants one. And uh, if they can just get this one round for the next 56 minutes, they will be truly delighted to add to his portfolio of wins as well as to Maserati's. And they do have a new rear body section on the back end of this car. Yes, they've got some big tape out this time. I uh, did go and have a word with Stuart Roden during our last break, and uh, he explained that they did they did try and put the the other fresh rear end on the car, but there simply wasn't anything left to attach it to. Um, so they were going to come in and, and, and drill it and attach it properly and then tape it on top as well. Uh, so it was a fairly lengthy stop and uh, a little bit of housekeeping and a tidy up done on the car at the same time. They didn't, again, stand to lose or gain anything. They're in 17th place overall and uh, the next nearest challenger behind there in 8th place in class. So they'll, they'll gain a point, but um, scant reward for a lot of hard work for Stuart Roden's men this weekend. I'm free this. It's hard work for everybody, isn't it? That's the thing about the 24 hours, that whether you come first or last, there is always a huge amount of work needed to achieve either of those positions. And there goes the cost car. It was the legacy of an overnight accident from Fabio Babini that they needed to replace that rear end at all. So um, who's got the call for the last session in that car? Did we see a... A driver change going I think on. That should turn. Fernando Montwell. It's Montfordini, was it, who brought it in? To be quite honest, I wasn't watching. There's a thing. So I don't know who brought that car into yeah, Pit Lane. Jamie Davis. He's uh, probably due a turn on rotations. That doesn't mean we want to just spin it, Jamie. Okay. Yes, uh, we'll say nothing about him at all, I don't think and uh, instead talk about the number 55 CR Scooter rear car currently handled by Tim Mullen and currently in fourth place and currently in the pit lane yes. just, just shy of uh, a podium finish and I'm sure that being just that close to a podium finish will be almost as annoying to Chris Niarkos as being nowhere near it mm. because it just shows that you uh, tried your hardest and it just wasn't quite good enough and that must be really frustrating but this is a very frustrating race yes it can be immensely so a little clean of the screen they've obviously used up the tear-offs they had four on the screen to start with 
and uh, they will have used those up overnight predominantly where you really need to get a, a good visibility out through the uh, out through the front we're going to put those tyres on yes we are at some point but we've got the car up on the jacks that slick work in the pits isn't it that uh, wheel gun was on and chattering even as it was going up on the jack and so that front wheel came off just as the car locked yeah. into position yeah and a wet coming off there from the of it rather than an inter so that would have been quite hard work uh, for Tim Mullen in the last section there's Andrew Cocordi and he is two places further back on the leaderboard and only one in class. Yeah. Uh, sorry, two in two class. In class yes. Yeah. Two in class, three on the road. Just just trying to look. And he's made his uh, he's made 25 pit stops to Tim Mullins 54. So I'm imagining that they are now done till the finish. 52 minutes to go. And we, although we haven't kept a, a tally of their pit stops, I think that's probably made its last stop, hasn't it? Henri Moser is the man immediately between the two CR Scuderia cars. Still no sign of uh, Mike Hazemans and the Corvette making their promised return to the track. No, I've just looked between uh, Tim Mullen and Henri Moser. On our leaderboard is the number eight Lamborghini of Peter Cox, which is why we keep talking about him in GT2 times, uh, because we keep looking at his name in between the GT2 uh, leaderboard times. And 2.22, he's just put it his last lap. In that, so he's getting faster in that Lamborghini as the track dries out. Yes, it looked as though he was coming up to put yet another lap on to the uh, CR Scuderia car of, of Andrew Cocardi. There is the rather splendid Lancia Mercier Lago, uh, Lancia, Lamborghini Mercier Lago with, as you said, Richard, the barn door nailed it's, to the back of it. It's a monster wing. <laughs> Just imagine the amount of power you need to drag that down the long straights here at Spa at speeds approaching 180, 190 miles an hour. That's the power in that Lamborghini engine. Oh, Look pretty, at it. Pretty sure it was his uh, pit crew we saw standing by just now. So an emptying fuel tank will mean a lighter car will mean one that can kick out even more speed. Just flirting with the wet curbs there and not wanting to do that too often, Peter. You're toying with cliche then, weren't you? I was trying. Yes. And, and into the pit lane. As you predicted, here he is. Such a dynamic looking car. And I don't suppose at this late stage in the proceedings we're going to do anything other than fuel this unless he's got intermediate tyres on there, which judging by his lap times I would say almost certainly he hasn't. No. Those are lovely posh slicks, they are going to change them though. Yep, looks like it. If they take an intermediate off that car now, I should be deeply, deeply impressed with Peter's lap times. Uh, and that might explain why he was running wide onto all the wet bits there at the end, but I think that was just, he was going so fast he didn't have a choice. Yes. There, the fuel hose comes off, the tyre comes it's all yes. shiny and flat. Shiny and flat, so slicks off, fresh slicks on. And serene progress for our number one car, still owing us a pit stop. Remember to hand over for the final time to Andrea Bertolini, but Eric van der Poel will ring at least one more lap out of the uh, tank of fuel he already has. You sort of think if you're Eric van der Poel and you can remember last year, you'd want to get out of that as fast as you can now. Or you'd want to absolutely prove a point and stay in. For your own satisfaction as much well, as anybody else's. Well, no point in taking chances would be my opinion. And. Uh, Again, that car moving across onto the wet bit there, and I just wonder about the tyres on there. But Eric van der Poel, what's he in the tie twenties? So he might still have a uh, an intermediate tyre there. But yes, two twenty-eight. Jamie Davies out and running now, and uh, already into the groove, lapping at the same pace as Andrew Cocody in the CR Scuderia car, who's been out for some considerable while. Van der Poel, Pierre Guidi, Darren Turner, and uh, Darren Turner is the quick man of that trio, 2.24, his lap time last time around, mm. 2.29, Pierre Guidi, 2.28 for Eric Van der Poel. 
Yes, Darren Turner, I suspect, has been the quickest man in that number 10 car throughout the weekend. Uh, but as ever, we stand to be corrected by the, mm. the uh, sums and numbers as the rain starts to fall again on the pit straight. That's because I said I glanced to my left and saw brighter sky, isn't it? Yeah, and once again, the rain's just drifting through the Spa region here. We're on board with Tony Vlander in third place in GT2. And as we have seen demonstrated in the rain in Italy a couple of years ago, uh, he is very good when conditions are poor. Uh, but that's all they are at the moment, is poor, isn't it? They were, they were, they were poor with an O-U-R at Mugello, weren't they? My goodness, <laughs> yes. tip down. Monsoon tyres were the order of, of, of the day, and if you had a boat, you were probably better off than if you had a car. On board with Emmanuel Collard is a man who's driven cars in pretty much any condition you care to think of, whether it's GTs or prototypes or single-seaters or anything. Um, rare man has that absolute ability to step into any car that he chooses and make it go quickly. He was uh, two or three seconds quicker than... Uh... Malicelli, yes, three seconds just about quicker than Malicelli on the last lap. But uh, I'm afraid he's got far too much distance to even think about catching him unless Malicelli is caught out by conditions or a tyre choice that doesn't quite suit. No, Collo has got to be able to unlap himself and then unlap himself again in mm. order to, uh, to get anywhere near to uh, class honours here this weekend, which will be a disappointment for, for Porsche. I'm sure they would have wanted to see revenge for their, their loss at, uh, at that race in France in June. On the other hand, mm -hmm. Malucelli, I'm not sure where uh, the uh, team are in the Drivers' Championship, but they're not at the pointy bit, are they? Uh, not at the moment, no. And they might be closer uh, as a result of collecting points at 6 hours, 12 hours and 24 hours, but I don't think it's going to do Collard an enormous disservice in the Championship. Well, Collard's already behind them in the championship. Um, Roberto and Malicelli, uh, oh. after, after the 12-hour points, are in third place in the championship on 27, just one adrift of Thomas Biaggi and Christian Montanari, who, let us remember, will not be taking any further part because Christian Montanari parked the car somewhat heavily at Blanchemont overnight. Um, so Roberto and Malicelli will extend their lead over... Um, it'll be actually David Rigon and Joel Camathius. Now, they're all in the one car, aren't they? Mm. So they will all move up, consequently, in, in, in lockstep, as it were, uh, with the same number of points and advantage. And that is one of the pros for putting all your four drivers in one car. Absolutely. Collard, look, on the kerbs, all over the shop. Collard driving out of his skin, as always. He was just astonishing at uh, Osher's Lehman last time out in that car but uh, I stand corrected because this weekend has changed the points for him hasn't it? Mm, yes it rather has uh, Collard and Westbrook will uh, will fall back a ways uh, not perhaps losing a position to anyone because they were ahead of Rob Bell and Andrew Cacordi and they are as they are here at Spa so they will remain in fifth position in the championship but um, the, the, the gainers will be that Roberto Malicelli will move ahead of Biaggi and Montanari and Rigon and Cometheus will come that bit closer as well, may even have enough differential to pass them. So uh, Tony Vlander and Jimmy Bruni look set to uh, have their lead substantially increased. They already have a 17-point margin at the head of GT2. Speaking of Tony Vlander, we're on board now with the number 50 car. Uh, after a very brief splash and dash visit to the pits. So no tyres taken with the AF Corsa. No shakes the head from my left. So we've got a, a second stint for driver and tyres in this uh, number 50 AF Corsa car. It's not really a stint, is it? 44 minutes remaining and the, there is well, its last trip into the pits, I think that was it. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's proper that, rain, isn't it? Yeah, and that's starting Ooh. to head our way as well. Now, it could be construed as pretty much a proper stint in terms of a two-hour race because, yes. you know, about one hour ten would be the limit for a GT2 car under normal circumstances for, for fuel. Yes, so, indeed. stretch out by five minutes and you've got where we are and, by golly, we have now got real 
heavy rain falling again on the pit straight. This is as heavy as it was earlier on, but without the wind now blowing it around, uh, the wind seems to have dropped. The flags are a little more limp on their masts than they were earlier on. Michael and Bartels and now, Andrea Bertolini yeah, are going to have a little power up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh dear, what's the decision here? Bertolini just waiting to take the car over for the last uh, half an hour has got a decision to make. Ultimately, it's the driver's call. The big question, which we cannot answer, dear viewer, is how far round the lap does this weather extend? But look at it out. Out of our window now, we have got the heaviest rain we have seen all weekend. This is real, proper, heavy Belgian rain here. And as Graham said, there is no real movement in the clouds above. There's a little bit of wind, but nowhere near what we had before. And that means that it's only going to rain on the start-finish straight by the look of things, because it looks relatively dry here, doesn't it? It does, although the, uh, the wiper was running on the number one car, and it's Eric van der Poel at the wheel, who will be uh, praying that he gets around. Look at the spray, the rooster tails thrown up and from the back of these there, cars. Yes. Now, that's the first time we've seen that much spray coming off the backs of the cars, I suspect. So um, he will now be wanting to be very sure that he gets the cars back to, to safety. Bartel saying, slow it down, slow it down. Well, let's have a look at it because he's got a, a lap in hand over his teammate who is obviously not going to challenge him. And then seven laps back to Darren Turner in the number 10 car. Turner is out there on slick tyres as well. Mm. Uh, so whatever happens, it's going to happen to the both of them. If they come in now and go for an intermediate, they have got all the time in the world to come back and go slick again if the occasion demands it. But uh, you'll start to get fed up when you're in, out, in, out, in, out. It starts to become fairly wearing. And there have been times during the course of this race when the weather has actually been like that. It's been so fast that it's almost lap by lap the conditions have changed. Mm. That is wet there, isn't it? But I'm not sure that it's actually raining there anymore. No, very hard to tell from the, uh, from the camera's perspective there. Maybe as the light gets onto the lens, we'll see a little better. No, no, that's the Kessel Racing car still in the hands of Henri Moser, 10th place overall and 5th in GT2. In relative terms, they will be pleased with that, I would have thought. Absolutely, and Emmanuel Collard three seconds quicker on his last lap than uh, Malin Shelley. Those are intermediate tyres, that's the Vitaphone pit garage, and uh, that's a bunch of people who haven't quite made up their minds, isn't it? Mm, yes, it's the will we won't we thing, isn't it? Number two has gone through Alessandro Very Pierre cautiously. Gini. Very cautiously, from the look of things, both out of the window, which is a rare luxury for us, and also at the screen. Piagini just turning in almost at uh, a tick over pace, isn't it, really? There's a dry line there still, uh, but of course, all the water will run downhill and drain away. As we've said, Spa drains really well. And. Uh, it's raining, or it's rained here. I'm not entirely convinced that it is, in fact, raining there anymore. It's still uh, a light rain here at the start line, but I think it was just a drenching, and I think if we all keep our nerve, everything will be all right. What's yes. Darren Turner doing in terms of lap time? Yes, look, he's gone out to a 2.36, so conditions have affected him. Pierre Guidi, 2.56. Has he stopped? No, he hasn't. No, no. At 2.40 for Van der Poel in the number one car. But uh, it's yeah. wet. They're, they're taking water around with them, I think, rather than it being actual rain. Yes, Piggy just being very circumspect, I think, on that last lap. And um, Eric van der Poel is some 4, 16 seconds faster than uh, either Piggy or Turner on the last lap completed. But that was just immediately before this last heavy splash of rain landed. So van der Poel's last time was his last sort of semi-dry time next one will be substantially slower, I would imagine. Well, he's uh, obviously content to sit behind uh, the number eight car there. Decision time has come and gone for Eric van der Poel. He's out there on slicks. They've made a decision, haven't they? They've reached their decision. Yes, that had a look of, uh, of finality about it, didn't it? 39 minutes remaining. Look, he's being uh, tapped up by a GT2 oh, Moser, for a... oh, look, he's wide, Ooh. he's wide, he's very wide. <laughs> he's got it back together again. That's how easy it is. Oh, my word. And onto the concrete runoff there, thankfully. 
But Pierre Guidi seems to have lost all his confidence in the car, doesn't he? He's just, uh, he's just backed way, way off the pace. Stefan Daoudi going past in turn as well in the JMB car. I think it, uh, if you, all you need on a circuit like this is one of those moments where you suddenly discover that the car's in charge instead of you being in charge. Mm. Uh, and you really do have to think, I've got to back out of this because otherwise the car will just do whatever it is it chooses. Yes. Yes, it's, uh, it's a very, very difficult situation. And at Spa, which more than any other on our calendar is one that already separates the men from the boys, the conditions here just amplify that. Yes, and the conditions here at the moment are uh, a continuing light drizzle over the start line, but nothing like that sudden little downpour that we had. And confusingly, the cloud has broken up a bit and yep. the sun is shining. And I think this is just going to dry out. And I think everyone who kept their nerve then mm. uh, will be re amply rewarded and I think Vita uh, uh, decided that the smart thing to do then was nothing and yes. see what happened uh, yeah. and they've been repaid haven't they and five minutes ago we had the heaviest rain we've seen now we've got the first threat of shadows falling on the ground <laughs> for the whole day and uh, we're looking like uh, a dry line and we're looking like back up to speed for the number two car there you can see for yourself the problems we're dealing with it's still cloudy overhead the sun is shining the track is dry ish and it's kind of raining in places and we have 37 minutes left on the countdown timer Too, does he? Because he, it's going to be, if it's 70%, it's going to yeah. be something like 150 laps. In, already, yeah, isn't he? in fact, all he should do is come out and roll around the last lap just yeah. to be running. Yeah. Collard's in the pits. Do any harm, can they? Not from second place. Well, Pierre Guidi was really sliding around, isn't he? He's, he's staying in the car, so it's up to him. Blue skies over Spa, unbelievably. Five minutes ago, we had the heaviest rain of the weekend. Four minutes ago, it stopped raining. Two minutes ago, the sun came out. Now we've got blue skies. 
And uh, those people who held their nerve and stayed out on slick tyres are probably going to be rewarded. We've just seen the number two Maserati of Alessandro Pierghidi dip into pit lane for a little splash of fuel and a tyre change, and he took intermediate tyres. Mm -hmm. Now, we saw, as Graham pointed out, uh, he was looking very uncomfortable in the car, or a lot more uncomfortable than previously, uh, and so that might be the sensible decision for him because it is still very wet in places around the circuit, and with 33 minutes on the clock, and an advantage of some 15 minutes over yes. Darren Turner in terms of actual time, uh, he can afford, really, to get this wrong, and if this isn't the right tyre, it isn't really going to hurt him. No, it really isn't going to hurt him. There are parts of the track where it's clear clearly still very damp, uh, and if that is the case, and if Pierre Guidi, who has stayed in the car, felt that he was uncomfortable on slicks, which clearly he was, given the way his lap times were falling away, maybe it was just a comfort zone thing for him, just a, comfort, a comforter, a little bit of, uh, of confidence uh, that he's put the inters on uh, to give him that margin uh, for the last half hour. The last thing he needs to do is to be... Uh, spinning the car into retirement this close to the end the team's seen it happen before they don't want to see it happen again they've nailed the first two places well and truly this year they've deserved what they've apparently mm. now got and uh, the last thing they want to do is to have anything come along and spoil their party Darren Turner, of course, is the man in perhaps the trickiest position. He's out there on slicks. It's the right tyre for at least half the circuit, mm. and it's the wrong tyre for about half the circuit. His job, keeping it on the island on the wet bits like this, is going to be slightly harder than Pierre Guidi's job of keeping it uh, ship shape on the dry bits on intermediate tyre. So Darren Turner is the man in more likelihood of paying the price for the mm. tyres he's got on the car at sure. the moment. Well, no, there's no right choice, is there? No, no, it's very difficult, and yet if you wanted to, to nominate a driver to put into an Aston Martin at this stage, it would be Darren Turner, simply on the basis that he has so much experience in the cars from his time with uh, ProDrive. There he is crossing the line, and only a scant few yards ahead of... Uh, it will be, won't it, Pierre Guidi? Yes, it is. Pierre Guidi crossing the line now, so it's entirely possible that Pierre Guidi, if he is indeed on a more appropriate time for most of the lap, may actually come back, come up and put a, a further lap into Darren Turner. Well, we'll have a look uh, as they go past. You can see... Oh, no, you can't really see, can you? There's some goo on the rearward-facing camera with the uh, giveaway of Aston Martin, but somewhere in the gloom there is that Maserati, and look, he's just reaching, it's very wet here at Le Calme, but uh, Turner staying in it, his problem will come at the end of the straight uh, when he goes for the brakes, and uh, it was somewhere there that Carl Wendlinger uh, lost his Aston Martin, was it not? Uh, yes, Carl Wendlinger taking a rather tighter and defensive line into Le Calme, uh, appears from what he's told the assembled press here, appears to have hit a wet patch towards the edge of the track. The car speared right and hit the barriers hard, and uh, sadly, it then rebounded into the middle of the track, collecting the Mike Hazeman's driven Corvette number six, uh, which incurred damage to the front of their car, and uh, retirement for the Aston. But it's relatively dry here, as you can see, uh, and you can see the dry line. So, it does appear as if Darren Turner's all right on half a lap and, uh, as we say, Pierre Guidi's all right on half a lap. And uh, looking behind, above the uh, bar, there is Pierre Guidi, and I'm not sure that he's any closer no. or any further away, really. No, it, 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 seemed, it seems to be a bit of a concertina effect, doesn't it, that Pierre Guidi, as you say, has a right tie for half the lap and will maybe close up a bit under, under that part of the circuit, but then Darren Turner will ease away when the track conditions favour his slick tyres rather better. The sun's shining, Richard. Yes, it's just an amazing <laughs> place, isn't it? Absolutely, it's just like little England here, isn't it? You just never know what to wear, do you? What shall I put on to go outside? Well, we'll do fashion tips off we go off air, I think, if that's OK. Basically, it's the but same choice that the teams have to make, though. Yes, what it what is. do I wear? And you're never going to be right. You'll have 
the right clothes for some of the time and the wrong ones for the rest of the time, and that's exactly what's happening with their tyre choice. Mm. Right sometimes, wrong sometimes. With less than half an hour to go, Andrea Bertolini has taken off the crash helmet. Eric van der Poel, I wonder if he will be given the honour of taking the car across the line now that he's this close and in order to clinch his, clinch his fifth Spa 24 hours. Yes, and to get the a monkey off his back, so to As speak. As it were. Yeah. Yes, because uh, with about an hour to go last year, Eric van der Poel spun out not far away from here, actually, as I recall. Yeah, not very far at all. And um, now, if he can take this car to the finish, then he will, I feel sure, feel that that uh, blight has been lifted from his CV and that he need no longer worry about the last couple of hours in a, a 24 hours of Spa. No. When, when and if he takes this chequered flag and collects his fifth Spa victory to be the unassailable record holder in that department for the time being, I wonder if he'll hang up his crash helmet and say, I don't need to come and do that again, or whether he will say, that was easy, I'll do it again that next was year. fun, we'll come and do that again, yes. see if we can get six. Yes, I mean, it's, it's a, a huge achievement to win these, these long, long races multiple times. And uh, very few people achieve it, so hats off to... Hats off, sorry, Eric. Eric van der Poel, a fame for wearing a cowboy hat most of the time, yes. he's not wearing a crash helmet. So hats off to Eric van der Poel for his, uh, his achievement in that and his bottle in staying in the car for the last session because it was he who parked it in the gravel last time and cost the team the race. Michael Bartels was talking to the Michelin man uh, just a moment ago and he looked very relaxed and happy about the situation, didn't he? Mm, yes, I think he should too because van der Poel was, uh, stuck in a 2.42 last time round. The, uh, the slightly battling, but only for the sake of it, Piergidi uh, and Turner managed respectively 48 and 40, 248 and 245. So it was just advantage Aston last time round in the uh, who's got the best boots competition. But you can see there from that picture, although there is water on the surface and although there are rooster trails from the back of the cars, the sun is beaming down and reflecting off that wet surface. Uh, and Spa has the reputation of draining and drying very quickly. Yeah, 112 there, uh, Ange Bard mentioned him earlier on this morning in coverage. Still in third place there in the G3 uh, Championship. The, the, the two uh, cars, uh, 123 and 124 of Milner Motorsport, still heading up that category. Uh, six laps apart though, and a further four laps back to Ange Bard. But, uh, on the card, at least a podium finish in the G3 category. Podiums in GT2 from Alicelli, Westbrook and Villanda, 77, 61 and 50, first, second and third. CR Scuderia is there in fourth place and again in sixth place. And uh, Fabrizio Del Monte has now taken over the 57 Ferrari uh, handled moment, uh, moments ago uh, by Henri Moser. There's the leader in GT2, just poking his nose around the outside of the Porsche and looking very confident indeed. Mm, absolutely so, and as if to say, excuse me, Porsche, it's Ferrari coming through. Well, and l looking as if he's a man who's very sure that the tyres he, he's got are the right ones for the job, and that's what we've been told all through this weekend, and that's what we've been saying all through this weekend, that uh, his tyres are absolutely spot on for exactly these conditions. Bit of rain, bit of dry, that's the tyre to have. Yep, the uh, the G3 class is uh, pretty well represented in the bottom half of the top page of time in the scoring, so they've managed to keep these cars going. They're, of course, not as highly stressed in terms of, uh, of performance as the GT2s and GT1s, but nonetheless an achievement for teams which don't have the funding either of those uh, of the uh, higher category contenders. And funding is an issue we were talking earlier on, just about the uh, size of the fuel bill to drive a car non-stop at racing speeds for 24 hours. If you work on the basis, they're probably not doing 30 miles to the gallon and that they're probably not using uh, the fuel you get out of the supermarket mm. pump, but some kind of special witch's brew of a somewhat higher octane that might cost at least, say, double what you pay for your petrol. Mm. And then look at the fact that we've done 567 laps of a six-kilometre circuit, and you can work out for yourself that you need very deep pockets indeed just to keep going. 
Yeah, it's a thick end of three and a half thousand kilometres, so pretty, pretty good. Yeah. So uh, budget is an issue. Uh, there's no question about it. And to be able to survive 24 hours at this sort of pace in this sort of company is an achievement. It's a bit like climbing Everest. It doesn't matter how long it took you. The fact that you got there at all is, what is noteworthy, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And that will be true of uh, everybody in our current top 20, assuming that Mike Hazemans does bring the, uh, the car out from the security of its garage for another tour, at least one more tour anyway. Um, Mike Hazemans will be running and crossing the line at the end of this race in, uh, in eighth position, sorry, in sixth position in uh, GT1. Oh dear. Now, that was the 112 we were just looking at a moment ago, wasn't it? I think it is, and it looks... We had a message on our screen saying slow car uh, at turn 16, but now it's a stopped one. It's a stopped one. Ange Bard, I wonder what that is. Mm. Well, you've okay. broken that. We don't, it's the first one of the weekend in 24 hours, but we have finally cursed one of our competitors. <laughs> we'll have to wait for an update from uh, the crew as to what happened there. Turn 16 is a fair way round the lap. That's Blanchimont part of the world, it's isn't it? It's just before, yes, it's just sort of out of uh, Stavolo and into Blanchimont. OK, well, a potential podium then, at least for Angebard, may be denied and handed in turn to the uh, the Pro Speed car. So Pro Speed would end up with a podium in, uh, in both GT2 and G3. This is the uh, GT2 Pro Speed car at the moment. Richard Westbrook is the man in charge. And second place, and he is not even remotely challenging this man for the class leadership. And uh, at the risk of doing them an enormous disservice, I'm going to say they look very strong at the moment. As and they have throughout. If they carry on doing what they've been doing, they just can't get this wrong, can they? No, there was a brief period yesterday early on in the race when it looked as though the Porsche was going to overhaul them. But uh, they fought back, stayed strong, and they have not missed a beat all the way through this 24-hour race, so kudos to them. Number 50 in pits, uh, Tony Villander brought that car in, and we picked it up just after he arrived, and I think that's just a tyre change and a splash, and I don't think there was a driver change. Can't see the crash on it. What about this, though? Fourth place uh, with 21 minutes to go for... Ben Orcott, who came here wanting a podium. He said he wanted to get into the top five and then finish on the podium. He's in the top five, uh, and uh, barring mishaps, he's just going to miss out on a podium finish. And again, just missing out is almost as bad as missing it by miles, isn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely. Or, perhaps and, even worse. And to reiterate what you said just a few minutes ago, they will have finished and finished well, uh, which is more than can be said of many of their more perhaps illustrious competitors in terms of, 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 of paper thoughts anyway. Indeed, and uh, again, while we're talking about budget, this is a, a team that has a budget entirely provided, well, largely provided by the man at the wheel at the moment. Mm. Uh, and that's a credit that you can be a privateer in this championship, pay for your racing yourself, and be in one of the cars that is right there at the top of the class. Let's face it, their first, second and fourth here yes. this weekend. Uh, that is one way to go racing, isn't it? And uh, uh, although it might not be one of the front runners, it's giving them all a chance to show what they are capable of doing, and it's giving us a chance with my yet another Maserati on track. Absolutely, and the man sitting between second and fourth is uh, the only non-Maserati up at the sharp end of things, Darren Turner, in the Gigawave run Aston Martin, the DBR9 still showing well at the top of the field, and one wonders what would have happened had Carl Wendlinger not had the moment, well, Wendlinger had not had the moment that he did um, late last night up at the uh, area where uh, Darren is just approaching now into the braking area at Le Combe as we watch. It was just before that turn in that Wendlinger's car suddenly snapped to the right and, uh, and speared into the wall, bounced back onto the track and uh, unfortunately caught Mike Hazemans who had been following him fairly closely uh, at the time. 19 minutes to go and uh, the number two and number one car on track there uh, circulating together as mm. if they're shaping up for one of those photographic finishes. Surely not. Do you think they are? How pleased are the sponsors, do you imagine, that this Vitaphone 
joined by uh, by DHL this weekend, and uh, there's the crowd assembled to uh, to watch and marvel. Yes, the grandstand uh, choice of seating at Spa has changed as the new pits have opened and the new pit lane uh, is in place. You see the kids there. We are not worthy. Uh, I presume they're waiting for. The, well, no, they can't be, can they? Because they're facing the wrong way. But the grandstands have moved in position, and the seat of choice is no longer on the hill on the run down towards Eau Rouge, but in fact opposite us. Uh, uh, not because they're looking into our commentary box, oh. of course. Oh. <laughs> Heaven forbid, but no. They're looking at the start finish line uh, in front of the pits. And when the old lot gets knocked down, there'll be nowhere to sit, will there? No, and if uh, Alessandro Piagidi here is a smart man, he will allow. Uh, Eric van der Poel are passed, so not only do they have one two on the uh, on the photographs, but Pierre Guidi will have to complete one lap fewer because he will take the lap just behind. And there it goes. And there it is, just behind instead of just ahead of his uh, his sister car. And it'll look nicer in the picture, won't it? Quite right. And uh, yes, Michael Bartels has uh, doubtless been on the wireless. Andrea Bertolini. Uh, was ready, wasn't he? Had his crash helmet on, he was ready to go, but they've changed their minds and left Eric van der Poel out there. And with 17 minutes remaining, they have got a very comfy lead. Uh, they've got a 1-2. Uh, they've got a nice collection of points. They're going to strengthen their grip on the championship. They won it last year by the narrowest of margins at the final round of the year. Thomas Biaggi was the one who took the title because Michael Bartels had to miss a couple of races for medical reasons. So there was only one champion in the Maserati at the end of the season in GT1. But as you said, Graham, earlier on, they went to the final round with a dozen people breathing down their neck and it was all decided at Zolder. Ange Bard, we are told, has um, got the 112 car moving again and indeed he has he's currently just completed sector two of the lap uh, on his way back through he was in sector three when he stopped so he's bypassed the pits and carried on so whatever was the problem he seems to have resolved it satisfactorily for the time being who's in for splash and dash one of the maseratis and i think it's the uh, number one car the, yeah. the two the crew were in the uh, pit lane there the board was beside them saying number one yeah. so I assume that that's what's going to happen that would make more sense for it to be the number one car having stopped earlier Michael Bartels just checking everything's still in order yes again you don't want to risk anything by running on fumes on the last lap no, I'm sure that uh, it's all part of the plan one thing we do know about this team is they always have a plan and uh, if um, a last minute splash and dash is part of it then uh, they're quite capable of doing it very quickly indeed it is however Maserati Maserati Aston Martin Maserati van der Poel Pig Edie, Turner and Ben Orcott first to fourth Malicelli leads Westbrook and Tony Villander in GT2 So, which of them will come in? We're expecting number one. It'll be Eric van der Poel who brings his Maserati into the pit lane entrance there. would it be if they finished on the same lap as well?
Take it off, plain time. You're dirty Samuel Clark. Six minutes, you'll really be fine, won't you? Yeah. Well, as long as you drop everything and run, you'll be fine, won't you? We are 12 minutes and 5 seconds away from the chequered flag, or at least the final lap of the 24 hours of Spa. When the race leader goes over the line for the final time with the clock showing zero, he will get the chequered flag. If, on the other hand, he goes over the line with the clock showing 0.1, <laughs> then he's got to do Round another lap. Again. So uh, I'm sure that's not part of the thinking of the team. Uh, the Vitaphone Maserati crew have produced an absolutely fantastic and consistent display, as have this crew. The 77 car has been in charge of GT2 since the race began. It hasn't missed a beat. None of the drivers have put a wheel out of place. As Brian was saying earlier on, it looks as though it's only just started the race, never mind finishing 24 hours mm. uh, in uh, some occasionally mucky weather. I'm very impressed with the way this uh, team have driven the car, the team of four drivers have driven the car and the team of mechanics have looked after it, fettled it, kept it sweet and that uh, they just seem to have peaked at exactly the right time in terms of form, don't they? Yes, you wouldn't have bet on this if you looked at their uh, form through the first half of the season. Occasionally quick, but not brilliant, you would have said. And yet, this has been a standout performance. Yep. Maserati, you expect them to produce that level of performance. And uh, BMS Scuderia Italia with that car and those drivers, you don't, no disrespect, but you don't expect that based on previous form. And that is an achievement until you come to Le Mans this year where they finish second so they've now just climbed up that final step if you like and uh, and got to the top which is a great result for them uh, we must remember that they are although not perhaps with the Ferrari 430 they are a hugely experienced team they ran uh, GT1 cars for Aston Martin for a good while and uh, had the degree of success with that too but Coming into GT2, they had a new car, a new class to learn, different way of going racing, and uh, they seem to have just realised that endurance racing needs a different approach again from the two-hour sprints with which we're more familiar with in the FIA GTs, and they have certainly come to grips with that very well indeed. We're looking at uh, second place in G3 at the moment, and uh, we're looking now at that fantastic rear wing on the number eight... Lamborghini which is still Peter Cox and has now made 34 visits to pit lane. Third place in GT2, Tony Villander, AF Corsa, championship leaders, runaway championship leaders it has to be said, dominant force in GT2 last year, the year before and again this year uh, but not this weekend. We've lost one car which uh, is probably now recovered from Blanchiment, but certainly was uh, parked there uh, quite mm. flamboyantly, should we yes. say. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. In, the, in the night watches. And uh, now second place for Pro Speed, Richard Westbrook, Manuel Collard. Not what they came here for, but uh, not a result to be dismissed lightly. No, and joined by Mark Lieb to make up the, uh, the three driver strength 
for the 24 hours. And again, on paper, you would have been hard pressed to bet against that, mm. that, that trio coming out as winners. Um, but they haven't. They've uh, they've beaten what on paper would have been their strongest opposition in terms of AF Corsa, but they haven't defeated BMS Scuderia Italia. That's the nature of these long races, though. That's why it's so endlessly fascinating, because nothing is what you expect by the time you get to the end of the race. Uh, and with eight minutes on the clock, you're looking at pretty much the top three finishers in order there and uh, you're riding with second place there is the first place car just coming up behind and to put a further lap onto third place in g3 which is Ange Bard, who has managed to recover the car and get it going again from uh, where we saw it stopped out on the circuit near Blanchimont uh, whatever was um, was prob was causing problems for Ange Bard, he seems to have rectified and got that going. Sadly, not the same for Gael Le Soudier, who we saw park his Ferrari at the uh, side of the track up near Eau Rouge and poke around in the engine bay with a large stick. Um, <laughs> didn't that that didn't, all, surprisingly though. enough, do the trick. And, uh, and there they will stay for the rest of the, uh, the duration. But I'm sure he did exactly what the rest of us do. Then when your television stops working, what do you yeah, do? Yeah, yes, give, give it a smack. Yes, Absolutely. normally that does the trick, doesn't it? It hasn't worked with his Ferrari. The sunniest weather I think we've seen since the race began is with us now, although it was quite sunny yesterday afternoon. But this weather has, once again, although it hasn't been the true spa downfall, weather has been a significant factor in this race and it's given everybody something to think about. It's made this a very long and difficult race. There's been no period when you can say, right, those are the right tyres, those are the right drivers, all we've got to do is cruise round and we'll wait for four hours and see if the weather changes. It's always been what's happening around the corner, what's happening next with the weather, and there's been no rest for the teams. We've seen some of them sleeping on the floor of the boxes. All the mechanics have had to stay awake and pay attention for the last 24 hours. This has really been a proper endurance race for the entire pit lane. Not that it will make a shred of difference to the point scores as, uh, as they roll down the screens at the end of the race, but Peter Cox has hauled himself up onto the same lap as Tim Mullen in the number 55 CR Scuderia Ferrari GT2 car ahead of him. And uh, last time through was some 40 seconds behind, but 14 seconds quicker with roughly three laps to go. <laughs> if you do the math, dear viewer, you may find that it could be a grandstand finish for eighth place on the road, but it won't affect uh, class positions. Peter Cox, obviously, like someone to chase, it's always useful to have a target. At the moment, you're looking at Darren Turner in the number 10 Gigawave car. His target now really is just to get round the next three laps of this race and see the chequered flag. He is uh, about uh, eight laps down on second place and not liable to catch them. Uh, and he's equally eight laps ahead of fourth place and not likely to be caught. After that uh, little splash of fuel for number one, the Maserati pair have managed to re-establish their photo opportunity. Miraculously, for there the they fans, are. For the fans and the TV cameras. First and second in the race, first and second on the road, one and two in order. And although there was a half lap difference between them when the uh, pit, last pit stop took place, there they are absolutely tied together so this is definitely a stage finish for them and who can blame them because although it's all gone like clockwork for them or seems to have gone like clockwork for them this too has been the product of an awful lot of preparation planning and hard work during the night michael vartel saying not yet not yet not yet don't preempt it let's not tempt providence here but they are uh, uh, two laps, I'm not sure where are we, oh yes, they're going to have to do two more laps, aren't they? Yes, I would think so, which will um, please Peter Cox no end, because he's clearly having a lot of fun out there. 16 laps quicker last time than, than Mullen. I mean, he should be quicker, let's be fair, a GT1 car should be quicker. Oh, what's this? Oh, into pit lane, and this will be fun, because the pit lane has already been invaded by spectators wanting to get onto the wall. Uh, at least, they, you say, we say spectators, they should only be team members but it's a final splash for insurance for Matteo Malicelli to, uh, to just make sure he gets round this last couple of laps. 
He's in no hurry. He's got a couple of laps advantage over Richard Westbrook in the Porsche. And are we going to do... We're going to do the full Tyra service, well? yeah. Now, you see, you should not be seeing that picture at this stage. There is a live race going on. There is a car in lead of its class in the pit lane, and the marshals have signally failed to stop people just waltzing across the middle of the pit lane and out onto the pit wall. Now Matteo Melicelli has... Uh, we'd love to see that. I was about to say we'd love to see that through the screen of the car. They cut yes. away in case of case of carnage, I suspect. But um, that's very naughty to have allowed those people out of the garages while the race is still live. It is a racing tradition as he gets safely away, look, uh, and leaves the pit lane. But uh, a track invasion at the finish of a long race is... Uh, Unfortunately, what uh, many of the fans expect to be able to do. And that's all well and good if the, if the checker flag has fallen or if, in pit lane terms, the cars have commenced their last racing lap. But at that stage, they hadn't. Um, what's that making smoke so as we yeah, so go up the hill? No, I think it's one ahead of him that's already... I think the Scuderia Cross car with the Maseratis is driving through the smoke laid by somebody ahead of them all. I was just looking at the lap times of Van der Poel and Pirkidi last time, 2.44, 2.45, pretty much identical. Uh, we've got 2.30 left on the clock and they are on the final lap. I believe they will go slow enough on this lap for the chequered flag to fall next time round because they simply can't be caught now. I'm going to throw a little suggestion in that I think I saw the edge of a white car disappearing out of shot ahead of these three. The smoke could well have been a thoroughly locked up and crossed up Peter <laughs> Cox having a great deal of fun and uh, having taken another 17 seconds last time round out of Tim Mullins' GT2 41.2 in that sector when everybody else is 45 and 46, so that's him four seconds quicker in one third of the lap. So again, he's on the same sort of pace, isn't he? Indeed, he was 17 seconds faster faster than the Maseratis last time around, so Peter Cox clearly in for a lot of fun. And they are cruising to the finish now, and that Porsche in the middle there wants to get on with the job, and a little bit of a lock-up there, and I believe that is one of our G3 runners, is that? I wonder if he just picked up a little bit of damp along the way, just maybe is not on the best tyre for the job and was looking to find a piece of damp to cool things down a bit. Oh. He was right over at the edge of the track, wasn't he? There we are. First and second, one and two, and now on their way home. And uh, Darren Turner is uh, about five laps behind the uh, second-placed Maserati and uh, still 42 seconds on his first sector of this final lap. And uh, with a minute to go on the clock, they're backing off, backing off. They want the chequered flag at the finish of this lap. They don't want to go round again. They will have to back off considerably then because they're at Blanchimont. Yes. With still 50 seconds, 51 seconds on the race clock. But they are just tooling round, aren't they? Look, there's just on the Saturday after, Sunday afternoon drive to the shops at the moment and going slower and slower. That is how close they are. The chequered flag will be shown uh, after 24 hours have elapsed and the next time the race leader goes over the start finish line so that's why they're going that slowly but they're already at the bus stop i don't know if they can draw I this out 23 seconds I yes don't they, think can. they can not without parking but that was uh, peter cox just going past them so it might yeah. not have been him who create look they're going to stop if necessary 14 13 somebody's on the radio telling them don't cross the line don't cross the line yet uh, eight seven <laughs> They've crossed the line with seconds still to go. <laughs> the, li the race is not over. We haven't been shown the chequered flag. They've gone back to line astern, and all those people hanging over the wall are going to have to wait a further lap for their reward of seeing the cars take their one two. Well, look at that. That's the only thing that they've got wrong in 24 hours. I think I'm going to forgive them. I'll tell you what's interesting, too, is that um, it looks as though Mike Hazemans has come out of the pits finally in the number six Corvette uh, and is somewhere out in sector two. Um, he's going to have to do another lap to take the chequered flag as well. He hadn't counted on that. No, that's true. <laughs> and, and good for Malucelli that they came in and took their extra little splash of fuel as well, if they were, if if they they were, were on fumes. Well, if yes. they were on fumes. They do, uh, these are, don't forget, cars derived from road-going cars, and they have all the bits that the road cars have on them. 
uh, and a lot of that goes in the dust CD in. player, air con. Yes, exactly. But what they do have that the road cars have got as well is a fuel warning light. Mm. And driving round when you've got two laps of spa to do with the orange light blinking at you must be a nerve-wracking experience. Absolutely must. But here are the uh, Maseratis again line astern running down the hill down towards the bottom of the track and uh, towards Stavolo. Andrea Bertolini beckoning somebody across to join the party. A Swiss flag out for Henri Moser at the Kessel Racing part of the of the pit lane as well. What a strange end to a 24-hour race. I'm not quite sure I've ever seen anything like that before. Not to have missed the, missed the flag by three or four seconds. Yes, just a yes. little bit too quick on that final lap. And having to do another one, and so they'll get another celebration. They'll get another round of flag waving from the marshals. And don't forget that the race isn't over until you drive round the slow down lap back into Park Ferme yeah. under your own power. Yes, you yes, run yes. out of petrol on this last lap after you've crossed the line and don't get back to Park Ferme. Mm. I'm afraid it is curtains. So uh, yes, you're quite right. That Kessel Racing very wise not to take that chance. This time, uh, through Blanchimont, they can afford to uh, keep it going at a sensible speed, but they will slow down for the uh, photographic opportunity of the season. Mm. Others following through behind have realised that they're not being greeted by a flag and have picked up their pace again. But nobody in danger of gaining or losing a place, except that Peter Cox did, in fact, make his... Uh, his charge happily through as finally, the finally. The flag. there it is and now the team can celebrate as uh, Vita Fone Maserati take first and second place Eric van der Poel in the number one car collects his fifth spa win don't stop there you've got to keep going I know the temptation would be to stay with the team but you've got to do another lap of this enormously long circuit and bring it back home into Park Ferme uh, Darren Turner will finish third, uh, Ben Orcott will finish fourth, just off his uh, targeted position. And in fifth place overall, Matteo Malicelli is going to win GT2. Here's third place though, this is Darren Turner in the Gigawave Aston Martin with Ben Orcott right behind him on track, although some six laps adrift on our scoreboard here in the commentary box. So there it is, third place for Gigawave. My two Euros didn't actually buy me a win, but I'm quite happy with third. And uh, two British teams across the line together in third and fourth place. Yeah. Fourth place at Spa is nothing to be upset about. No, I think um, JMB won't mind being referred to as a British team well, for the time being, because Ben Orcott is a man who allows that programme to happen, courtesy indeed. of the depth of his pocket. Um, uh, it's a British funded team and it's a British driver and this is all British of course although they've got some foreign drivers the rascals but they've all done jolly well indeed and so have these now this is quite for me this is still the performance of the weekend I think for uh, the 77 car and that crew uh, and for BMS Scuderia Italia this GT2 win is just quite something and I'm sure that it's going to be a while before they get over the uh, pleasure that they are about to experience of taking this GT2 chequered flag and the, the mm. full house points order as well. I suspect the um, the Mike Hazelman situation is the car hasn't come out again because the I'm sure the numbers we're now looking at for the sectors one and two are those of the last lap, which of course they didn't complete because the car was in flames. Uh, and pushed up pit lane and wouldn't have crossed the line because they don't cross the line to get into their pit. It's the one pit at the beginning of pit row as there goes Matteo Malicelli to take, formally take the GT2 honours for uh, BMS Scuderia Italia and congratulations to them taking the win over the Porsche Pro Speed team of Richard Westbrook, Manuel Collard and Mark Lieb. And it's Richard Westbrook who goes over the line. So it's not been a bad day for uh, the British drivers and teams here at Spa. In fact, it's not been a bad two days. And the uh, traditional flag-waving reception all around the circuit to the winning drivers. 24 non-stop hours, apart from putting petrol and changing the tyres for the uh, whole finishing contingent here, but especially, of course, for the, uh, the winners. 
and uh, what an achievement by uh, IBP Spartak to bring that Lamborghini mm. home after three changes in gearbox and 34 pit stops. Still the record holder in that department, and which is something I'm sure they wouldn't wish on anyone. No, exactly. And then to have the confidence to drive the wheels on it in the last half hour uh, in order to, to finish number eight car in number eight place on the on the uh, starting and finishing order now is the appropriate time for the pit lane to look like that and indeed it does uh, the sun has ceased to shine the low clouds are looming in over the hills and spa's about to dish out uh, another bucket full of rain i feel sure but it won't matter to anybody now it's all over for another year at the 24 hours of spa but of course it's not over for us because we've got half a championship still to go no G2 finishers. We should mention the the, uh, the lower classes, if you like. And one, two, three, and one, two, four. The two Mulner Motorsport cars will complete their uh, their top two steps of the podium in the G3 category with the Ange Bard driven one, one, two Ferrari of uh, Francois uh, Jakubowski's team, AS Events entered team in third. Never mind that, Graham. Tell me about the Coupe du Roi. The Coupe du Roi. It was suggested to me earlier that the, because they are so far behind, they are 303 laps behind, right? Yes. So they've covered less than half the distance. So they won't of be the classified. Winner, that uh, if they are awarded the Coupe, it should be the Coupe du Roi's second cousin's brother's auntie, because actually it can't be a king's performance can it not really no. however the coupe du roi is there and it's the 182 car of jmb there was only one team in it and um lo and behold they appear to be ready to finish and take the plaudits meanwhile here is second place just pulling in the number two uh, maserati alessandro piagini a little smoke from the uh, Lamborghini going across the background there. Pit lane very busy, as you can see. There's a lot of people here who want to congratulate the people who have done so well. We've been talking about winners, we've been talking about championship points, uh, but we did say earlier on that uh, just finishing a 24-hour race at a circuit like this is an achievement of monumental proportions. Oh, absolutely. It's absolutely an enormous challenge, an enormous task. And anybody who has brought a car home this weekend at the end of 24 hours is really someone who can afford to pat themselves very firmly on the back. It just isn't easy. Not everyone can do it. And that's the challenge. Why they keep coming back year after year. That's the reason we'll be back next year. Oh, because absolutely. you just don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Up on the roof. Brilliant stuff. Lovely to see Eric van der Poel there jumping for joy and a very popular win with the Belgian crowd opposite the uh, the stopping point for the cars there. And uh, in the grandstands, everybody's on their feet applauding Eric van der Poel. They'll be waiting to applaud him again when he gets up on top of the podium along with his teammates and, uh, of course, the crew of the number 10 car. And we'll be there for that. A minute, I thought it was the leak dancers again. <laughs> well, if he's done seventy percent.
If you haven't been with us for the last 24 hours, this is some of what you've missed. These are the closing daylight moments of the Spa 24 hours, round five of the FIA GT Championship. And uh, that was the demise of the number six Corvette, uh, and the 62 Scuderia Cross Car, trailing bodywork and uh, strategy and planning on the part of Michael Bartels and Andrea Bertolini, which has brought their cars to the finish in first and second place ahead of uh, Darren Turner. We've had little tiddly bits of rain, but it's never lasted, and it's never lasted long enough to make uh, intermediate tyres a serious proposition. And I think everybody who's been in and switched to intermediate tyres outside of a scheduled pit stop, really looking back, will regret that call every time. Yes, the, the majority certainly will. The only, uh, the only real difficulty, of course, was for the G3 guys who don't have the option of intermediates. They only have wets or dries. Um, so an intermediate tyre here and a good one may well have been the difference between uh, the top and the second step of the podium. Certainly that was the impression we were given uh, in terms of GT2. Maserati, however, have done it as much as anything on sheer strength and persistence good planning good execution and uh, congratulations to them others have fallen by the way but this year at spa belongs to maserati certainly does uh, and uh, of course the complete points collection uh, belongs to them as well uh, because they have been the race leaders uh, pretty much continuously and uh, with half points at six hours half points at 12 hours and then full points at 24 hours this is what's happened to the championship table Michael Bartels and Andrea Bertolini now well clear of their own teammates who in turn are a handful of points further in front of the crew of the number 10 gigawave Aston Martin it was uh, a two point yep. margin between first and second place and then everybody else behind and this has now opened it right up hasn't it it has and the real losers are the next people listed down there which are the Corvette and the other Aston Martin the Jet Alliance car both of those have been leapfrogged by the um, by the team of uh, Simonson and Peter uh, further down the list, no points either for Christoph Bouches and Xavier Marsen. Stefan Sarazan back into the series for another race. There's the uh, podium, shortly to be populated by all our winners. We're expecting uh, podiums, full top three podiums for GT1, GT2 and G3. As Graham said, there isn't any G2 because both the entrants of that uh, fell by the proverbial wayside some while ago. And... Uh, so there's going to be a lot of people up there because most of the entrants came to the race with four drivers mm. per car. So there'll be 12 people up there on a, each podium. They'll need to dish out plenty of baseball caps when it'll be a busy hat dance going on to get all the appropriate hats onto people's heads for the photo ops. Yes, and the crowd gathering in the pit lane as the drivers line up that's the giga wave crew, crew as you can see quite clearly there the uh, blue and white and the big g it's just, just a slight just a give small it's clue the, isn't it the giveaway <laughs> <laughs> philip peter and alan simonson the regular pairing there joined by darren turner and andrew thompson for this event and everybody else taking their time there's an awful, always an awful lot of congratulation to be done and uh, in fact, they've done very well to get everybody up the stairs that quickly. All the uh, the Maserati team appear to be pretty much present there. Michael Bartels at the forefront of things, as he should be. Eric van der Poel just behind him and uh, coming out onto the podium now. This will get the local fans going because this, of course, not just a win for Vitaphone Maserati, but win number five at the Spa 24 Hours for Eric van der Poel. But uh, onto the podium now being pulled up third place crew of uh, the number 10 car first to take their position on the third step of the podium and then it'll be both of the Vita Bone Maserati crews the number two crew out first number one who have taken the win or be the last to make an appearance but it'll be the same national anthem nonetheless Great support from the uh, the crowd who have stayed right to the end here at Spa across the uh, the road across the track. No track invasion, just the uh, the pit lane. And here are the winners. 
Eric van der Poel uh, delighted, delighted. There he is, coming out last, but receiving, you know, the biggest ovation from the uh, people across the way. And, in fact, they're on their feet in the grandstand. Uh, and, uh, of course, the uh, Vitaphone team not short of supporters here. Of course, they were not far from Germany. Not yeah? at all. And uh, uh, plenty of German fans make the journey across to see the German team. German national anthem, of course, and now they can uh, afford to jump up and down and uh, throw their hats in the air. And we've said before, although there are 12 drivers up on this podium, although there are three or two teams represented, the crews of three cars represented, there is no award big enough to mark out the achievement of everybody who's brought a car to the finish of a 24 hour mm. race. It's hard enough being an observer of a 24 hour race, never mind actually doing it. The biggest enemy is the clock, isn't it? That's, that's your first thing you've got to defeat. You've got to defeat the hands of the clock that sweep round ever so slowly when you're in trouble. And uh, getting the right pots to the right people would be um, a good start up on the podium. So we'll uh, wait while the, uh, the cups are presented. Here they come. And uh, we'll do, I'm sure, Miss World Order, three, two, one. Well, I'm not certain that Darren Turner wants to be called Miss World, even if he has come third at Spa. <laughs> that was my dark horse prediction at the start of this weekend, and I haven't done too no, badly. Pretty they, good. they are uh, on the podium, which is better uh, than some people have managed. So I'm going to call that... I'm going to pick my two euros up and keep it. Good man. And good. Uh, uh, second place, again, that is... Mm, for the seconds. This is absolutely according to the script for Vitaphone Maserati, isn't it? It is, yes. Miguel Ramos and Alexandra Negrau, the two regular drivers in that car, joined by Stefan Lamaret and uh, Alessandro Piagidi. Uh, both the two whom actually have uh, had their moments and contributed to the success of uh, that car and that team. Oh, yes, there isn't really room for a passenger here. If you're on the entry list as anything other than a strict reserve, you've got to pull your weight. Uh, and they all have, and we've seen some uh, fine drives in the number one car as well. And again, the regular pairing, Michael Bartels and Andrea Bertolini, joined by the prodigious talent of Stefan Sarazan and by Eric van der Pola. And Stefan Sarazan, I think, has, uh, has shone at yeah. various moments. Eric van der Pol just uh, a faultless and classy driver, isn't he? Yep, absolutely. He's uh, usually a safe pair of hands. Last time out was very much the exception rather than the rule. And the first man to win this event for a fifth time. And as he uh, lifts his cup in celebration, we can all say that the memory of uh, last year has now been properly exorcised and he doesn't have to worry about it ever again. Nor do we have to mention it. I was going to say, we'll probably not be talking about it much either, will we now? Because it's all over and done with, because they have done what they came here to do, and that is win uh, rounds uh, five and a quarter, <laughs> five and a half, no, no, it's five and five and an eighth, five and a quarter, and five and a half <laughs> of uh, the FIA GT Championship. I'll have to do the percentages. You've been away too long, haven't you? Yes, Richard? That's I have. the trouble. They've won basically two rounds and collected points three times during the course of the weekend. But more importantly, what they've done is win the 24-hour race uh, at Spa, and uh, they did it uh, two years ago. Yes, and they've given themselves a massive, a massive leg up towards this year's championship as well, because although it is 
a standalone event, if you like, in terms of prestige, it is very much part of the FIA GT Championship for a full season. And uh, those who win here have a good advantage over those who fail. I think we've been coming here for eight years now, and on only two occasions, and one of those was last year, has the winner of this race failed to collect the GT1 Championship at the end of the season. So the odds on them ending this year as champions yet again are reasonably high as a result of this win and the points they have collected this weekend. We we'll need to uh, try and persuade this lot to relinquish the podium positions ready for the next class to be presented. So I think they're being moved aside fairly swiftly. No, there's more photographs. No, no, I think they're just picking up laurel wreaths. Or are they? No, it's for one it's, more group hug. Yeah, photographic time once again. And uh, I notice there's no bottles of champagne in sight at the moment, but you can't help wondering if they're only just round the corner. There might be a few cracked in the hospitality tonight, I would imagine. 